Ah, thank you, Gregor. All right. Um, thanks for deciding to go ahead and attend the class on ship support skills. Uh, I'm Fenris Fenrir. Uh, most people just call me Fenris because, well, the whole thing's just a bit of a mouthful. Um, the class should be roughly about 60 minutes and kind of gave roughly about 30 minutes after that for Q&A if people have any questions. Um, the class is going to be here on Mumble and in the class.e-uni chat channel. Um, if you have questions while I'm going over stuff, please feel free to type them out in the class.e-uni chat channel. Um, if I don't answer your question immediately, it's probably because I am going to be covering it shortly. If you think I've just forgotten about your question, please don't hesitate to post it again. And so, yeah, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So, like I pretty much said in the forum post, anyone who's been in the uni for very long or even looked at the wiki has seen a mention of support skills. And the wonderful thing about them is we, the older players, we tend to just use support skills as this general broad category. And if you look at your skill tab, there is no skill category that specifically says support skills. And so that's what this class is going to do. It cover what the support skills actually are, what they're useful for. Um, the wiki has a page on support skills. There it is right there. And while pretty much every single skill I'm going to be talking about is on the wiki page, um, we're not really going to cover them in the same order that the wiki page does. Um, as I've gone through and skilled up and started to fly multiple races ships, I found that some skills translate to every single ship you fly. Other skills are far more specialized in what kind of ships or roles they support. And so we're pretty much going to cover them from a top-down point of view. Uh, we'll start with the skills that affect everything and work our way down. But first things first, what are the support skills? Support skills are skills that do not necessarily allow you to use a module or to use a ship. What they will do is they will make your ship, your modules, better. Um, but, you know, and I can see some of y'all thinking, well, wait a minute, my, you know, ship skill makes my ship better. Well, yes, yes, it does, but there are better options. Ah, one second, I got a phone call. Yes, Banky, that is my ringtone for my wife. Um, it is nice, it is catchy, and it very much so reminds me of her. Um, so, <laughs> that being said, Yes, I, I brought my phone to class considering I am teaching from the comfort of my own living room. Um, it is wonderful that and ignoring phone calls from your wife tends to get you in trouble. All right, moving on. Um, ah, shoot, where was I? Oh, yeah, what are the support skills? Okay, so the <laughs> – yeah – the actual individual ship's piloting skills or module use skills, for example, the Memnitar frigate skill or the small projectile weapons, allows you to use a set module and gives you bonuses for using that set module. However, there are other skills that will help make things better, and those are what we refer to refer to as the support skills. Um, as a general rule of thumb, support skills are not reliant on a specific module. Some of them do only affect a specific module, yes. But the majority of them affect entire broad of modules, if not your entire ship. And the ones that affect your entire ship are the ones we are going to start with. Um, 
the probably the ones that you will end up finding to be the most useful to train up first. Um, and if somebody could go ahead and link these, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, are going to be electronics, engineering, energy management, and energy systems operation. Um, Ezra, there is no way to train cloak from wife. That is called divorce. Um, the other one would, is energy management. There we go. All right. Now then, these four skills provide a good solid core for anything you choose to do in-game. If you click on electronics and you bring it up, under the description tab, you will see that it adds a 5% bonus to ship CPU output per skill level. Engineering does the exact same thing, except for it affects power grid. Energy management goes ahead and increases your total capacitor capacity, and energy system operation reduces the recharge rate of your capacitor. Now, I can see some of y'all going, okay, that's nice, why does all this matter? Well, one of the biggest problems that you get into with trying to fit ships is putting everything on there. And electronics and engineering directly increase what you can put on your ship. If you have a ship that has a 100 power grid with engineering 5, you can put, you had now have 125 power grid to play with. Same thing for electronics. This gets very important once you get into the Tech 2 ship classes. Um, Tech 2 ship fits are extremely tight. Um, how many of y'all have actually trained into a Tech 2 ship of some kind? Okay. A lot of y'all. All right. I'm pretty sure y'all have run into the fact that those ships are a lot harder to actually fit everything on than their Tech 1 counterparts. Um, in part, that's because you have a lot shinier modules to put on them. But it is also because with the extra slots that they grant, a lot of times you're trying to put more in them, but they do not get a significant boost to their power grid or CPU. Um, and electronics and engineering directly boost that for every single ship you fly. Likewise, energy management and energy systems operation allows you to do more when you're out. Um, particular, you won't run into this generally in PVE um, unless you are playing around in a wormhole. But in PvP, you will have people that try to annihilate your capacitor. So on top of running all your defensive modules, all your you know offensive weapons, offensive systems, if you are um, Amar or Kaldari or Galente, um, you know people will actively try to screw your capacitor over, and those two skills directly help with that. And the great thing is, it is not reliant on any particular race. All four of those skills are going to make your life easier regardless of what race you play. Um, between, between the four of them, they form a nice little core that boosts every single ship you will ever fly. Um, the next set of them would be ones that actually increase the performance of your ship. Uh, Spanky, you know you're keying up. Ah, sorry. No worries. Um, accelerate, uh, not acceleration control. Evasive maneuvering, spaceship command, and navigation. <laughs> Those three skills, um, if someone would kindly link them. Those three skills affect how your ship actually performs in space. Um, Evasive maneuvering is a 5% bonus to agility per level of the skill. Um, evasive maneuvering, agility rather, is affects how well your ship maneuvers. 
Um, the higher the agility of your ship, the faster you will align, the tighter you will be able to orbit things. Um, so it will come in, it comes in very, very handy, especially when you start piloting the larger ships. Larger ships maneuver like whales if you do not have evasive maneuvering and spaceship command trained. Um, <laughs> believe me when I say they maneuver like whales. It, if you get into a battleship and you have not had, you do not have evasive maneuvering and spaceship command trained up a bit, you will feel like you are a beached whale. They do not align very fast and little to no skills in evasive maneuvering and spaceship command makes it feel even worse. Um, navigation is just a direct boost to your actual speed. It increases your velocity by 5% per level. So you get one of these spiffy little Minotaur ships that goes ahead and ticks along at a base of around 400 meters per second, and you get navigation trained all the way up to 5, and voila, you are now moving at 500 meters per second. And that's before you turn on your prop mod. Um, again, the larger ships, it is extremely handy. And uh, while I know that not everyone is going to speed tank a ship, especially the armor tankers, the good thing to know for folks that do armor tanking is that those three skills directly help offset one of the biggest penalties of armor tanking, which is making you less maneuverable. All right, now f for the fun ones. Um, these skills are not directly, the, well, these skills directly increase the ability of your ship. However, they also are sort of part of your tank, um, and they are mechanics, hull upgrades, and shield management. These Go ahead and they actually increase the durability of your ship. Mechanics is 5% of more hull per level. Hull upgrades is 5% more armor per level. And shield management is 5% more shield hit points per level. Um, I'm sure a lot of y'all are training into a Tech 2 version of tanking. So at least I would hope you are. At which point, I'm sure you are training at least one of these up as high as you can. That being said, having all of them at five makes any ship you sit in 25% more durable. That's a lot. I mean, it may not seem like it, especially if you've ever been in some of the PvP fights when, you know, you get almost blapped in one shot. Having all of them to five makes the difference between, yes, Lynn, 25%. Mechanics at five adds 25% more hull. Hull upgrades at five adds 25% more armor. Shield management at five adds 25% more shields. So if you have all three of them at five, your ship is 25% more durable than it was before. And yes, I know that varies some based off of your actual resistances, but as a quick general rule of thumb, it's roughly about 25%. The, and that matters a lot. Um, you know, yes, there are ships, even with all that, you're going to take a hit and you're going to be almost dead. The great thing about being almost dead is that if you're already aligned and trying to enter warp and you're not pointed and scrammed and webbed, you've got good odds of getting out of there where without them, Alpha Volley could have just killed you. And even for the folks that do shield tanking, you know what? Hull upgrades is fantastic. Once your shields go, having a bit stronger of a hull gives you an extra second or two to go ahead and try and get out of a bad situation or finish a foe off, whichever is more prudent in the case. Same thing with armor takers. 
you know, a little bit extra shielding means it's a little bit longer before they get into your primary tank. <laughs> yeah, um, I wish I was Miracle Max. If I had that level of cool factor, I would just be so happy with life. All right, now, the, that little set of skills forms a very solid baseline that upgrades every single ship that you ever sit in. And, you know, uh, can someone link one of the freighters for me? I don't really care which race's freighter it is. Um, they're a capital ship. There we go. If you guys take a look at the Fenrir and go look over at that fitting tab on it, or the obelisk, if you look at that fitting tab, you will note that it has no fitting slots. So the only thing that will make the Fenrir better out of the Minotaur Freighter skill bonus is going to be your support skills. If you want it to go faster, having navigation at 5 is the only way to do it. If you want to, well, implants, yes, are also another way, but skill-wise, your own personal skills, the only way to make that ship better is your support skills. Um, and those will matter. Anyone that's ever been through low sec, I'm sure you all have seen some of the larger gate camps. Those larger gate camps will attack freighters, and the only prayer a freighter has is just being able to get take the damage long enough to just get out. Um, so having something like all you know mechanics, hull upgrades, shield operation up at five helps with that durability. Uh, navigation, uh, uh, and now my brain's decided to try and fry itself. Uh, navigation, evasive maneuvering, spaceship command, and well since I, I do believe they actually require it. Yep, they do. Advanced Spaceship Command will go ahead and increase the maneuverability of that thing. Freighters maneuver like whales, worse than battleships. Um, you know, they're all support skills. They have nothing to do directly with your ability to sit in any ship. They, a couple of them do actually allow you to use certain modules, but that's a secondary benefit in a lot of cases, depending on what you're doing in life. All right. Now, we're going to go ahead and cover the ones that affect... We'll go ahead and we'll cover the ones that affect a pretty broad category of stuff, and these are the tanking support skills. Um... If anyone has taken a look at the wiki page on the Tech 2 tanks, y'all have probably noticed that it's more than just being able to use one specific module. So that's where the tanking support skills come into play. Uh, since the Uni flies a lot of shield fleets for whatever reason, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll cover the shield the shield support skills first. First one, and probably the biggest one, is shield operation. Um, shield operation increases the recharge rate of your shield by 5% per level. It is extremely quick to train, and believe it or not, it's actually good even for armor tankers because it lets that little bar that lets you know that it is time to turn on your armor hardener, it makes that little bar last a little longer. Um, for folks that are running an actual shield tank, uh, it comes in very handy because it will allow your shield to recharge faster. 
which means that your shield is therefore able to tank a bit more. If you were pl- if you were actually doing a passive shield tank, which you should only ever do in PvE, it is pretty much one of the fundamental skills that is required for that fit. The tactical shield manipulation is a skill that goes ahead and reduces the percentage of your shield that is gone before damage begins to leak through. Um, Whenever your shields are taking damage, if you have no levels in tactical shield manipulation, as soon as your shield hits 25%, it is possible for the damage to bypass your shield entirely and go straight into your armor. Every level you have in tactical shield manipulation drops that threshold by 5%. So at tactical shield manipulation 1, your your armor has to drop down or your shield has to drop down to 20% before you begin taking damage. Um Christoph, you know, I honestly could not tell you about most people. Um I, I do know that a lot of people are going to train it to 4. Um yeah, exactly. Uh, the Adaptive and Vulnerability Field 2 are a big part of a Tech 2 shield tank, so most people are going to train it to 4, and at that point, if you're actually flying mostly shield tanks, you will more than likely go ahead and increase it to 5 once you've got a lot of other skills rounded up to 4 or 5 or whatever they need to be at. It is useful to have it 5. The train time is one of those that puts it off to a little bit a little bit less important um, ideally if you've got if you've got it at four that last five percent's not really going to last that long anyway so eh, you can let it slide now the the other four shield support skills are not all that commonly used, um, mainly because of the nature of shield tanking. But, just to be thorough, these are the shield compensation skills. Things like, hey, there we go. Um, If you go and you take a look at any one of those and you look at the description, it gives a 5% bonus to EM resistance per level for shield amplifiers for something like EM shield compensation. Now, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of y'all are just going and thinking, but wait, that's great. Well, it would be great except for the fact that shield tankers have an active on resist module that by and large makes equipping passive shield hardeners, like, which is exactly what these affect, really pointless. Um, if for some odd reason you find yourself flying a ship that is shield tanked that has enough that actually has enough um, mid slots to fit multiples multiple shield hardeners, feel free to train them up. Uh, at that point, you are getting an active use out of them. Otherwise, particularly with them getting rid of their ability to boost active modules that have a passive uh, cell is correct. They only affect the passive modules. Um, and that is the reason why they tend to not get used. Um, the fact that they affect the passive modules and not the active ones, especially, they used to actually affect the active modules but they got rid of the baseline passive resist that active modules granted. Shield tankers used to have it all. What can I say? But those skills are the ones that primarily affect your shield tank. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. That's that's the one thing. There are corner cases or niche cases where they do come in very handy. If you are flying in a shield incursion and you've got a cap-hungry ship, 
they can be very handy to equip. Um, you know, you can fit them to plug a hole, and you can get a lot of usage out of that one without impacting your cap any at all. But outside of very specific cases, they're not going to get used all that often. Okay, so now to the fun one. Armor tanking. Armor tanking is one of those ones that has it, now has a slew of support skills going for it. Um, the first one and one of the biggest ones is repair systems. Repair systems decreases the cycle time of an armor repair by 5% per level. Now, this is one of those catch-22 support skills. You want to train it up to four to be able to use the Tech 2 armor reppers. However, every level you train up, arm, every level you train up repair systems increases the active armor tank's load on your capacitor. Yeah, you gotta love it. It is a skill that actually can help your tank while killing your tank at the same time. Because as soon as you have no cap to run that armor repper, you are just relying on your resistances at that point. That being said, training it up to four is definitely good. Uh, I would recommend not training it to five until you have very good capacitor skills. And by very good, I basically mean having energy systems or energy management and energy system operations at five. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah. Otherwise, you will find that a armor repper with repair systems five that you just turn on will go ahead and eat your cap like it's candy. All right, armor also has four armor compensation skills, one for EM, one for explosive, one for kinetic, and one for thermal. This is a skill that almost every single armor tanker is going to have up to at least three, if not better. Um, the reason being is that there is not an omni-resist active armor hardener module. Um, and by omni-resist, we're talking a module that affects all four resistances. However, armor tankers have not one but two omni-resist plates. Adaptive, uh, uh, shoot, now my brain's going to actually fry on me. The adaptive nanoplates and the energized adaptive nanoplates, or nanomembranes, rather. And these modules are completely passive, and the second you fit them, they go ahead and affect everything. Which means that these particular, yep, there's the EANM, and the other one is right here. These modules are passive, and they affect all of your armor resists which means that those four armor compensation skills directly boosts all four resistances that these modules grant. Comes in very, very handy. Um, the passive omni-resist platings, if you look through the ship fittings on the wiki, it, any armor tank ship, most of them are going to fit at least one of those modules, if not two. Um, they even come in handy when you are actually fitting very specifically for to boost specific resists. Um, a lot of armor tankers, when they go fighting PBE, they will go ahead and they will just put a passive single resist module on their ship, and this boosts the effectiveness of that. That's how they get away with it. Those, but that little set of skills pretty much covers the majority. Oh, wait, 
almost forgot. See, this should tell you something. I am actually been playing way, way, way too long. There are two other skills that CCP has added in recently that affects, there's one, armor honeycombing and armor resistance phasing. Um, Plebe, yes, generally you're only going to fit an adaptive nanoplate if you don't have the CPU for the energized membrane. Um, it, it's one of those silly little things about it. Um, and honestly, if you have the shield, the, if you have the support skills form trained up enough, uh, you'll notice a difference, but it's not in a, the impact won't be as big with the difference between the two. Um, the adaptive nanoplate 2 versus the energized adaptive nano membrane 2, you're looking at a 4.6 and change percent difference in resists. Um, so you can get away with it even if you want the CPU for other stuff, which is the usual reason why you do it. You can let you fit bigger guns or extra modules of, you know, CPU hungry modules. Armor honeycombing is a skill that they, that CCP added in to make armor tanking less stressful for players. Um, armor plates are, are the are equivalent of a shield extender. Um, if someone could link the 1600 millimeter uh, rolled tungsten uh, armor plate, There we go. This is the one that you'll most commonly see on anything bigger than a battle cruiser, and some cruisers can actually fit these. Um, if you take a look at the attributes tab and look all the way down at the bottom, there's a, there's a thing that says mass addition. Just putting one of these on your ship adds 2,750,000 kilograms to the mass of your ship. It does nothing for your ship's agility. In fact, it makes your ship harder to align because of the additional mass. Armor honeycombing reduces that penalty. So at armor honeycombing 5, your, only t your mass addition is only 75% of that number. Yes, that, that is one of the biggest reasons why people tend to use reinforced rolled tungsten plates, the, the Meta 4 armor plates, over the Tech 2 armor plates, is because the hit point difference, yep, there's the Tech 2 version. If you take a look at the two of them side by side, the Meta 4, which is the rolled tungsten, adds 4,200 armor hit points, versus the 4,800 of the reinforced steel plates. However, the reinforced steel plates, too, adds an additional million kilograms to the weight of your ship. It really does make a difference. Um, even with good skills, you're looking at adding a good second or so to your align time. Now, that's before armor honeycombing. The penalty's a lot less now, but... Still, mobility matters, even to an armor tanker. The other skill that they added in for armor tanking is armor resistance phasing. Um, armor resistance phasing is kind of special because it only affects one specific module. Yep, that's the one. The reactive armor hardener. Um, the reactive armor hardener is a module they added in that works very similarly to a damage control unit in that you, you turn it on and you pretty much let it run. It adds a 15% resist to all of your armor resists. However, it, depending on the damage that's coming, it will shift its resistances. What the armor resistance phasing skill does it inks the cycle time and the cap need. 
By reducing the cycle time, it allows the shifts to occur faster. And by reducing the cap need, it means that the module will not impact your capacitor as badly. That being said, you don't tend to see them getting used a lot. But if you're going to fit one, um, you will want the, the actual um, armor resistance phasing skill trained up to go ahead and make it, one, work faster, and two, reduce its impact on your capacitor. Um, and because I'm sure someone's kind of curious about why they don't get used, they, haha, we have a math genius in the class. Either that or someone that's smart enough to use the in-game calculator. Um, and I say that because I'm entirely too lazy to go and do that kind of math right now. Um, one of the reasons why the reactive armor hardeners don't get used quite a bit, uh, Francesca, that is exactly it. Um, it has 60% that is split among all four damage types. Um, it starts at 15% in each, and if damage comes in, it shifts those resistances. So if you were fighting someone who is shooting lasers at you, Every cycle, it will shift a percent, a percent away from explosive and kinetic and put a percent on EM and thermal. Um, if you have just EM coming in, it will actually shift 1% away from explosive, kinetic, and thermal and put it all on EM. So how much it shifts is going to depend. Um, but that also means that its usefulness is going to depend on who you're fighting. Um, against Amar, uh, missile users, it's great. If any of y'all have ever flown Memnitar ships or look, at least taken a glance at the type of damage that Memnitar can do with their projectile weapons, they have ammo types that cover three out of the four spectrums. Uh, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good at that point because it's basically going to be 15%. On top of that, it is not stacking penalized with your regular armor modules. However, it is stacking penalized with your damage control unit. Yep, there you go. And if you go and you look at the damage control unit, it already gives 15% to all your armor resists, along with all the other wonderful resists it gives you. Which means that most of the time, it's better to just equip one of the passive Omni Hardeners. Um, like I said, there are I'm sure there are specific fits that use it and use it well. I haven't run across any of them, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Uh, up until a few days ago, I had never seen an effective assault frig, assault frigate spider tank fleet, or gang rather, and we ran across one on a roam and got rolled. Um, so just because you don't haven't seen it in Eve does not mean it does not exist. Uh, Francesca, that's actually probably one of the few times I would actually throw one on uh, because I am lazy. And I do not want to have to shift modules out every single mission and just throw that on there, run it, and it will go ahead and cover the effects of the specific armor hardeners for me. Um, okay, and I know this is a little late. Um, I did actually forget one baseline skill that's going to affect your entire ship. Um, and I apologize for that one. And that's warp drive operation. Um, I have a feeling I forgot it because I've trained it up to five and consequently forgotten about it. Um, uh, Makuro, you are correct. They do offer max protection from shot one. However, you know, if you're going to be in, if you're going to be in a level four mission and just basically steamrolling it, it's just as good. Um, and it, 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 that's why I say. 
Okay. Um, can we go ahead and save the – we'll talk – I'll go over the reactive armor hardener a little bit more after we get the rest of the stuff covered. Um, we still have a few other – couple other categories of skills to cover, and I don't want to have to be here all day. No, Francesca, it's really a good thing to know, but it really is more about tanking and less about the support skill at that point. Just trying to keep the class from deviating too much. Um, warp drive operation is a very handy skill because it reduces the capacitor need of initiating a warp by 10%. Um, why that's important? Well, anytime you have to go and warp across the system, it calculates how far you have to warp and then eats up that amount of cap the second you enter warp. Um, some systems from gate to gate, you can be jumping 200 AUs. That's going to cap out a lot of ships that do not have just massively huge capacitors. Warp drive operation increases the distance you can warp, essentially. Um, for short warps, it also means that you are going to have more, less of your cap eaten up when you arrive on grid. Uh, there's nothing like being a logic pilot and having to do a quick ninja warp about 1 AU and hitting on grid and realizing that you have to call for energy transfers right off the bat so you can start doing your job of remote repair. Um, I have seen that happen. Uh, and when asked, the guy did not have warp drive operation past 1. And so just that short of a warp ate enough of his cap that, you know. Yeah. Uh, once you get it, what's your uh, warp drive operation at? And you can warp across seven systems without capping. You must not be making 100 AU plus warps system after system after system then. Because I've, I've got it at four, and uh, if I'm in low sec and I'm making, yeah, it's very important for fleet ops because the, the part of what you want to do in a fleet op is keep the fleet together. And if you're having to jump 150 AUs and half the fleet caps out before you get to the gate, well, if there's a gate camp, half your fleet just flew into a gate camp while the other half is having to let their cap recharge a little bit and then warp back to the gate again. So that gate camp is going to get to chew up the fleet piecemeal because people capped out. Uh, Makuro, the biggest cost of doing, of actually doing the warp is that initial cap drain. Almost the, if, if you ever go and you take about 100 AU warp, um, you'll go ahead and see exactly. The cost is based on distance. You'll go ahead and see, you'll go ahead and see your cap take this big, huge hit. And then as you're actually traveling through the warp, you'll see your cap recharging. The only thing that will be draining your cap while it is in warp is any active modules you're running. And yes, on long warps, your cap has some time to recharge. However, if you only had enough cap to initiate a 125 AU warp and you're trying to make a 150 AU jump, after 125 AUs, you drop out of warp. That is why fleet ops stress it so much. Um, warp drive operation up to three or four or even five. It's only a times one training multiplier. It takes something like six, seven days to train it all the way up to five. Um, it's That's one of the biggest reasons why. If you like doing a lot of fleet ops down in low sec, uh, I would definitely recommend training it up to five because it will go ahead and help you because some of those low sex systems are huge. Okay.
now on to the fun one, uh, something I'm sure everyone actually has several of, uh, and these are the offensive-related support skills. Um, these are pretty pretty easy to divide up into three categories. Um, the first category are the ones that affect your guns. The second category is the ones that affect your missiles. And the third category is the ones that affect your drones. All right. Um, while I normally do not advocate certificates, um, there is one that actually has a very good grasp on the gunnery support skills. This is Turret Control Elite. Um, if you if you just kind of keep it as a sort of a guideline, it's not really a benchmark. I'd never advocate specifically training for. Well, there's only one cert I'd ever specifically advocate for training, and turret control is not it. Um, however, all the skills that it, that are required for it are your basic gunnery support skills. They start off with motion prediction, rapid firing, gunnery, and sharpshooter. Um, these skills collectively make your guns better. Um, the motion prediction goes ahead and increases the, ta the tracking of your turrets. Um, and anyone that's ever been flying something like a cruiser or battle cruiser or even a battleship and tried shooting those little itty bitty tiny frigates that are trying to hit them, yes, tracking matters at that point. Um, no, having motion prediction at five will not allow you to use artillery to hit frigates on a regular basis, but you can try. <laughs> um, <clears throat> rapid firing. I I know when, but you know us us folks that use Artie can dream, right? Um, rapid firing increases the rate of fire of your turrets. Uh, sharpshooter. It goes ahead and increases the optimal range of your turrets. The baseline gunnery skill goes ahead and just is a, another flat out bonus to your turrets rate of fire per skill level. Um, there is one other one uh, and I can't find it now. Wow. I know I've got it trained. Ah, there it is. Trajectory analysis. Um, trajectory analysis increases the weapon turret accuracy fall off. Um, and between sharpshooter and trajectory analysis, they basically let you shoot further. Um, as anyone who has ever been outranged can tell you, having a lack of range sucks. Um, <laughs> so those two skills can help with that issue. Um, as, as you keep leveling up into your gunnery skills, you get a few more skills, fun little skills that open up. Um, surgical strike is one. Uh, it directly increases the amount of damage that all your weapons do. Um, and now I'm not going to be able to find the other one I was thinking of. Yeah, control burst. Thank you. Control Burst is the other one. Um, control Burst is mainly used by Caldari, uh, Caldari, Galente, and Amar pilots because it reduces the cap need of weapon turrets. Memnitar pilots generally don't care about cap need for turrets because projectiles don't use cap. That being said, if you are not flying a Memnitar ship and you are not using missiles, controlled bursts will increase your combat effective lifespan, which means you can stay on the battlefield longer. Um, now, those are the basic gunnery support skills. Um, obviously, the actual skill needed to use the turret involved um, is an important skill. However, that should be pretty self-explanatory. 
There are two other skills in the gunnery category. However, they affect all weapon systems. The first one is weapon upgrades. And weapon upgrades reduces the skill level of, of the CPU needs of turrets, launchers, and smart bombs. It comes in very, very handy. And the other one is advanced weapon upgrades, which actually requires weapon upgrades at level 5. And it reduces the power grid needs of weapon turrets and launchers by 2% per skill level. Um, those two skills, it, once you start getting into using a lot of Tech 2 weaponry on the larger Tech 2 ships, those two skills go from being good choices to required choices. Um, you cannot fit a lot of the larger Tech 2 ships with Tech 2 guns if you do not have weapon upgrades at 5 and advanced weapon upgrades at 4. Um, so any of y'all that are looking to get into something like a heavy assault cruiser, um, a command ship, any of the Tech 2 battleships, y'all will want to train those. Um, it is how people get all the DPS out of them because they can put full Tech 2 guns on them. All right. Missile launchers. Missile launchers is a fun one because almost the entire category of skills is one big class of support skills. Um, the first one is missile launcher operation, which increases the rate of fire of your missile launchers. Yeah, um, missiles are so easy. Um, missiles are easy until you start getting into the math involved and how they work to try and calculate how useful they are. And then if you do not enjoy calculus and trig, just get someone else to do it for you and explain using small words. And I'm really not making a joke about it. Um, I'm doing pre-cal, and I actually used the some proofs for doing... Yes, explosion radius versus sig radius versus velocity. It just, yes, I actually used Eve to get a passing grade on a, my, in my pre cal class one week. Uh, just because I linked, I, I did a link to all the proofs that I had personally done for calculating out missile damage. Um, okay, missile launcher operation is the baseline. Missile launcher skill, it increases the rate of fire. Um, missile projection is a skill that increases the distance your missiles will actually go. It does this by increasing their velocity. Um, the other skill that goes ahead and increases the distance that you can fire your missiles is missile bombardment. It increases the flight time of your missiles. Uh, for those of y'all that don't use missiles but have kind of been curious, missiles range is calculated by multiplying their velocity by their flight time. So those two skills will increase the the range of, that your missiles can actually hit out to. Um, the real easy gimme is going to be rapid launch. It does exactly what it says. Does anyone want to take a guess what rapid launch does for your missile launchers? It launches missiles rapidly. Yes, it does. It makes your missiles shoot faster. Um, now it's time. Oh, one more really easy gimme. And that is warhead upgrades. It gives a bonus to your missile damage. Now the next set, the next set of the missile skills, it's a little bit harder to quantify exactly what they do without turning this into a missile class. But guided missile precision and target navigation prediction are the two support skills that. They impact your damage, um, and they make your missiles better at affecting smaller classes of targets. Um, guided missile precision decreases the signature radius factor involved in missile explosions. 
target navigation prediction reduces the effect of the target's velocity on how much damage your missile is going to do to them. Um, like I said, I don't really want to turn this into a missiles class out of the blue, so suffice to say that those two skills allow you to hit smaller, faster targets more accurately with your missiles. Yes, Spanky, that is a very clear, direct, simple way of putting it. Um, and those two skills and how missile damage actually gets applied to ships is the reason why I got a passing grade one week in pre -cal. Uh, people laugh at it. Um, there is an entire wiki page devoted to how missiles do damage. If you're really curious, I would recommend going and looking it up. Um, no, Paul. It, it's not. That's the sad part. Um, it's sort of... It, it, in a very simplistic way, yes. It, it is essentially turret tracking for missiles, but it really isn't because missiles don't track. Missiles either hit you or they don't. It comes down to how they're going to actually do damage. Yeah, if you're really curious, the wiki page that Vesta was kind enough to link will go ahead and explain it all for you, including that wonderful little formula that will drive you insane. Um, all right, drones. <laughs> drones are the fun one. All right, the primary drone skill is also actually the primary drone support skill. It is quite simply called drones. <laughs> the drone skill allows you to operate one drone per skill level. It is a time one skill train, and I don't care what race you are, if you are planning on flying anything, well, if you're planning on flying, if you are planning on flying anything larger than a frigate, train it to five. Just doesn't have to be the very first thing you do. Most cruisers have a pretty decent sized drone bay. By the time you get into battle cruisers, the minimum drone bay you are going to find is a 25 meter drone, uh, cubic meter drone bay. And that is because drones are, drones are a larger ship's defense against smaller ships. And larger drones in and of themselves are extremely viable weapon systems in the right, on the right platform. That being said, the drone skill is also a requirement for, well, <laughs> all of the drone support skills. Um, starting from the ones that you can train from level one up, we're just going to do these in order of what the drone skill allows you to inject them. Scout drone operation not only allows you to use scout drones, it increases your drone control range. Drone control range is important because the further your drones can operate from you, the safer your drone boat can be because then you don't have to tank it as much. Shiloh, if you're not fond of drone boats, that's fine. You still will need to have drones up at five. Um, when you get into, when you get into battle cruisers, even the least drone boaty battle cruiser has a 25 cubic meter drone bay. Those drones are in there for anti frigate defense. Um, it is very I, you you will want a full flight of them out. Um, the other advantage is you don't really care for using drones. You know, hey. At level five, you can pop out five salvage drones at the end of your mission and, you know, walk away while your salvage drones do the work for you. Yeah. Um, all right. The next set of, or the next skill that you can actually get to inject that is a support skill is combat drone operation. Combat drone operation increases the damage of light and medium drones by 5% per level. Unless you're flying a drone boat, light and medium drones are more than likely going to be the drones you're using. So for any ship that has a drone bay, you can basically consider it a direct damage boost to the DPS of your ship. 
And on top of that, it's one that eats no cap. Um, the next one is drone durability. It increases the damage your drones can take. This used to be not so important for PvE. It was primarily a PvP skill. However, with the changes to the NPC AI that has been taken place that has taken place over the past couple of years, non-sleeper rats will now shoot your drones. Uh, drone durability matters. Um, in PvP, it makes it to where the frigates can't quite blow your drones up as easily. Um, drone navigation. Yeah, poor little hobbies. Uh, drone navigation is a skill that increases your drone's micro warp drive speed. This means they get on target faster and are applying damage faster. This is good. This is pure win all the way around because unlike a lot of other weapon systems, you launch your drones and then you have to, well, no, it doesn't affect sentry drones, but if you're using sentry drones, that's a little bit past where you need them need that. Um, ah, anyway, uh, drones, unlike a lot of other weapon systems that you can use, you launch them into space and they're there and they have to actually fly to the target to be able to affect it. Um, that's why drone navigation is important. All right, electronic warfare drone interfacing. The only reason it ever is going to get classed as a support skill is well, one, it's electronic warfare that does not eat up a mid-slot. Um, for anyone that's running a tight fit, there you go. The other reason is every level increases your drone control range by three kilometers per level. Um, if you have electronic warfare drone interfacing at five and you have scout drone interfacing at five, that is an extra, what is it, I want to say 40 kilometers to your drone control range, which, yes, gives you a 60-kilometer drone control range. Uh, Celtus, we're almost done. Um, so drone sharpshooting increases the uh, drone's optimal range, means they can shoot further, which is good. Uh, doesn't really quite keep them out of smart bomb range, unfortunately, but it does allow them to shoot a little further and also means of doing more damage to their targets that are within their optimals. Drone interfacing is a direct drone damage boost um, it, for y'all that you actually use mining drones. It will also increase your mind. Your, yeah, that skill is win. It will also increase your mining boost. Um, then there are the specific racial specializations. Um, honestly, outside of Memnitar and, Kaldar and Galente, Memnitar and Galente are the only ones that you ever really need to train. Um, Memnitar drones get used because explosive holes exist. Um, Galente drones get trained because... Even if someone has high thermal resist, the baseline damage on a Galente drone is so high that even after applying the resist, it still is out damaging its counterparts. Yes, that's actually the reason why Memnitar gets trained, is because Memnitar have the fastest, and that lets them keep up with fast frigates so they're good at annoying or swatting or driving away those pesky little interceptors. Um, I sell. So I can either confirm or deny that. Um, now then, that being said, there are other drone skills. However, they mostly pertain to using specific classes of drones. Um, they don't actually affect drones as a whole, and that's pretty much what we were looking at. All right, so the last category of support skills, and this is the one that while I could go infinitely in-depth on because there are so many of them, it is, for better or for worse, going to kind of get glossed over, lumped together. Um, and these are the E-War logistics and module-related capacitor skills. Um, there's also a few fitting support skills. 
um, and rigging. Uh, the the biggest reason why I'm not going to really try and cover all of these is because at that point we would have to extend the class like two hours to give them all a fair shake. Um, I will say that um, the ones that are probably going to be of most use to everyone and the one that everyone should probably try to pay at least some attention to is the jury rigging ones. Um, and, and under mechanics, there's a skill called jury rigging. And once you get jury rigging to level three, jury rigging by itself actually does nothing for you. Um, when you get jury rigging up to skill level three, it allows you to train these specific rigging skills. Um, as an example, uh, armor rigging. There we go. All right. Armor rigging, if you take a look at it, it gives a 10% reduction in armor rig drawbacks per level. Um, yes, shield rigging is going to do the same. All of the rigging skills pretty much have the same effect. The rigs themselves are what's important. And uh, can someone link a Trimark? There we go. All right. If you take a look at the medium Trimark armor pump here, uh, if you'll notice, there's three things really that you want to pay attention to. One is going to be the calibration cost. Uh, if you open up your fitting window, at the upper left-hand side of it, right over next to where your turrets are, you will see three little, sl three little empty module slots. Those are for rigs. Right above there, you will see a thing that says calibration. If you have no rigs in your ship, it will say 400 of 400. You only have 400 points of calibration, and that's where rigs get important. Uh, the calibration cost gets important. You can only put so much in there. All rigs are going to give a bonus. Um, that, in the example of the Trimark here, it's a hit point bonus. It increases your armor hit points by 15%. And then it's got a drawback. The drawback is 10%. Uh, the drawback is usually going to be described on the description page. In this case, it decreases your max velocity. The actual rigging skills are a support skill that decreases the penalty involved with putting a rig on your ship. So if you have armor rigging at 5, you can put a tr medium trimark on your ship, and you will get a 15% armor bonus and you will only get a 5% penalty to your velocity. And it is like that with every single category of rigs. And there are rigs for, yeah, there's pretty much a rig for everything that you can do in the game. Um, there are rigs designed to help you fit your ship by increasing power grid, increasing CPU, reduce the fitting requirements of certain classes of modules. There are rigs for increasing your DPS, increasing your tank. There are rigs for making you mine better, salvage better. Well, yeah, the drone rigging is not going to increase your drone damage. There's enough to do that anyway. Um, but you do get to do some other nifty things with your drones at that point, so... Eh, it, it's about it's a wash on the drone rigging, in my opinion. Um, there are rigs that boost exploration skills. So, the, um, actually, Francesca, yes, there is a rig that increases mining yield if memory serves. Uh, I'll hunt it down in a second. Um, the other the other class of support skills that generally comes in useful to know about, and I'm pretty sure you will be able to see why I don't really think there's time to cover it. If you go look at the electronic wharf, if you open up your certificate planner in your character sheet, and if anyone doesn't know how to do that, you know, X up, and 
I'll walk you through it real quick. Okay. If you go look at your certificate planner and you go down to electronic warfare, um, you will see ECM operator, EWAR operator, propulsion jammer, sensor dampener, target painter, tracking disruptor. As you go up into the higher levels of those, each and every single one has very specific support skills exclusively for it. Um, electronic warfare is that way. Um, the navigation skills are that way. Micro warp drives and afterburners have an entire set of support skills devoted exclusively to them. The high velocity helmsman certificate it will pretty much go ahead and tell you what all those are. Now, like everything else, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say, oh, you train for that cert or this or the cert. However, they do tell you what this, those specific certs for the E War and the na and the navigation will tell you what the specific support skills are for that particular particular module. And they, by and large, involve reducing cap usage or reducing fitting requirements uh, or increasing range and effect. Um, like I said, they're pretty specific. Don't really think there's time to go into them, but you know, if someone, if y'all want to stay around after we officially finish class, I'll be happy to go over what of them people have questions about. While we got the certificate planner open, the one cert that I will actually recommend that every single player get at some point in their career in EVE. If you go look at the core, go to standard and look at the core competency standard. I linked it there in class for you if you need. Um, this cert is probably the only certificate that CCP did right, in my opinion. Um, a lot of certs will have you training skills to levels that you don't really need to do a specific job. However, the core competency standard cert covers the bulk of the support skills. If you actually go look at them, a lot of the skills that we covered are in the list of things that are involved in these core competency certs. Um, that's the biggest reason why it is one of the more useful certs to train for. Well, so, uh, you know, uh, let me finish this real quick and I'll tell you what I think on that one. I, I'm not going to say that's a bad idea, but... Um, I'm sure there are a couple of support skills I forgot. In fact, yeah, there we go. That's the one. There's the two I was thinking about and forgot. Targeting, long-range targeting, and signature analysis. Um, <laughs> long-range targeting increases the range you can lock. Signature analysis decreases the time it takes you to lock. And targeting increases the number of targets you can lock. Yeah, multitasking is the second variant of targeting. Um, if you train targeting to five, it gives you five targets. Anytime, any player can lock one target. You have to train targeting to be able to lock more than that. Uh, once you get targeting up to five, you can train multitasking, so that way you can go ahead and lock up to 11 targets, or is it 12? I think it's 11. Um, it's been a while since I actually looked at the cap. Um, that's mainly useful for Logi, but anyone that wants to lock a lot of targets can do that. See, I knew I was forgetting something. Alright, um, but like I said, the actual core standard cert covers virtually every single support skill that we covered, and some that are far more specialized. Um... And that's 
that is in general the reason why I think it's probably the only one they've done that I would say is a must-have for any player past that's more than about six months old in the game. Uh, I know I know how it was my first six months in the game. I didn't want to have to sit down and do some long trains that didn't really seem all that important. Um, but, you know, that being said, when you choose to train it would be up to you, but I would definitely recommend training it all the way up to standard at some point. So, any questions? Um, I've got one, Fenris. I don't know if it's that related to the class, but it does involve skills and skill training. Go for it. Uh, I'll try and keep it on track as much as possible. Um, I'm in a bit of a dilemma where I don't know whether to train to Tech 2 guns or whether to train to like Engineering 5 and Mechanic 5 and Gunnery 5 first. What's your advice on that? Um... Yeah, that see, that's going to put me in a bit of a bind. I, all I can give you is my opinion. Um, you know, and that the the order you choose to train skills is always going to be up to you. Um, however, that being said, if you go and you look at what kind of Tech Two guns are you looking at training into? A small projectile. Oh, hey, yay! My favorites. <laughs> Well, I say that because I actually have them trained. Um, okay, now, I'm going to link a 200 millimeter autocannon 2 and a 200 millimeter autocannon 1. All right, if you look at them side by side and you go look over at fitting, all right, you notice how they're both using the same? Yeah. All right. That makes it, that's where the dilemma comes in. It's because the Tech 2 guns don't require a lot more to use. In fact, they don't require more to use, period. At least not when you're talking about the small ones. I think some of the larger ones do actually have a difference between the Tech 1 and the Tech 2s. But, that being said, where it's really going to matter is when you start training into a Tech 2 ship. Um, Tech 1 ships are very forgiving on their fitting. Um, you tend to have a little bit of extra power grid CPU to play around with. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, it, you know, that being said, you know, engineering, once you get it up to 5, it's done. It will always be useful. Ah, that sucks. A kid got kidnapped. Um, all right. Um, that being said, um, training engineering up is a one-time train, benefits every single ship you fly. Training into a Tech 2 gun only benefits you for that specific class of guns. Um, so, uh, actually, Christoph, that was my phone telling me that there's an amber alert around here. Um, so, like I said, some kid just got kidnapped. Um, yeah, it is, but it's useful to know, just, I don't think I'm going out this afternoon, but if I do, it's nice to know what to look for. Um, if, if, if it comes down to a question between training Tech 2 weaponry or a baseline support skill, I will always recommend training the baseline support skill first, because in my opinion, that will do you better longer. Um, I don't always fly ships, so I can't always put my Tech 2 projectiles on the ship I'm flying. The support skills I have trained, always useful no matter what ship I'm flying. Now, if, you're certain, you know, if you've got a set goal in mind and you know that you're going to be flying a Memnitar ship three months from now when you can train engineering up to five, probably won't hurt. Um, uh, let's see. Man, so many questions. Okay, no problem. So, um, 
Chow, most of the basic support skills are, are times one, yes. Um, there are a few that are more than that, but they tend to also affect more than just what you're, you know. Um, mechanics is a times one. Uh, hull upgrades, it's a times two. Hull upgrades also goes ahead. Uh, not really. Uh, Chow, did you get the link that, did you get the link that I gave at the beginning of the class? And I'm glad you guys have enjoyed the class. Um, I try. Believe it or not, it's actually the first class for the uni I've taught, so. Yep. That one. Um, all right. If you look on there, it has a very good list of all the support skills. Um, it's mainly a matter it, it's mainly a matter of what you're doing. Um, it's one of the reasons why the page is really useful. It helps to kind of have someone go over and clump them up into useful to everything versus more specific because of how the page is actually broken up. Um, yeah, I know I saw someone asking about the armor hardener. Uh, EANMs are technically better. However, fitting requirements means that you tend to just go ahead and put the adaptives on there. Um, or not the adaptives, the um, non-energized ones. Uh, Cecilia, it's, like I said, it's the first one that I've done for the uni. Um, I've had a bunch of practice explaining stuff to people. Um, both in life and in a game, so just never to quite this big of an audience. Um, if you guys don't mind, uh, go ahead and drop feedback on the forum thread. Um, I would definitely appreciate it. I'm going to try and teach some other classes when I get the time. I'll probably teach this one again at some point. Um, okay, so, wow. A lot of stuff going through. Um, yeah. So, any questions? Is there a link for me? I think it means maybe on the forum if you if you posted the class. Just the actual class thread would be fine. Yep, the one Francesca linked. Yes, Mick. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's me personally, and I don't think anyone's going to be able to leave me feedback there. I'd be a little scary if that could happen. Um, I'd ha really hate to read a lot of the comments. I'd probably rack up over the t over the days. Well, Econ, yeah, I, I did kind of want to look a little intimidating. I mean, I'm supposed to be a Minotaur pilot. I'm supposed to be feared and fearsome and, you know, not one of those pretty boy Kaldari guys. Um, like I said, if you guys have any questions, I've got a little bit more time. Um, And if you have a mic, feel free to ask on Mumble if you'd like. Useless bunch of skills you could avoid. You know what? No, not really. Um, you know, I, I hate to say it because it doesn't really help. They're really it, it, assuming you are assuming you are trying. Yes, it depends. The universal answer in Eve. It depends. If you are not doing mining, then training mining and its related support skills is absolutely one hundred percent useless. Um, you know, uh, it, yeah, it depends on what you're doing. Um, if you are, you know, could you be a little more specific about what you care to do in the game? That would make it a little easier to say what's useful and what's not.
Well, that's just it, Trance. Um, you know, there's a couple of very specific skills in the game that are just aren't really going to get commonly used. And even then, they do have usefulness for in a niche. Um, you know, even the passive shield tank boost skills have a use if you're doing a passive low cap shield tank. Uh, why you would do it, I don't know. Um, is it possible to do? I'm sure. Exactly. Plebe pretty much hit it right on the head. Any truly useless skill will get removed um, from the game, and they refund skill points back if you have points in it. Not a problem, Francesca. Um, you know, okay, before I forget about it, because I've seen a lot of the folks saying that they're training for the patch at the moment, then back to support skills. All right. You know... If you're skipping on training support skills to train into something for the patch, you know, in the long run, you're hurting yourself. Um, I, I know it's very tempting to get all the freebie skill points, but if you don't have the proper support skills to fly them in the first place, all you're going to be doing is getting pretty, very pretty, very expensive ships blown up, and your clone costs are going to go way up. Six and a half million skill points. That's what, or 6.2 million skill points, rather. That's what the patch is going to add to characters that have Battlecruiser 5 and Destroyer 5. That being said, any points you have invested in the skills are going to get multiplied out. So let's say that by miracle of miracles, all of a sudden, they decided to go ahead and put out the pack tomorrow. Okay, that means my battlecruiser skill, which is currently at four, I will lose it and I will end up with Amar battlecruisers four, Galente battlecruisers four, uh, Kaldari battlecruisers four, and Mimnitar battlecruisers four. That's because I have all four of the racial skill, racial cruiser skills at me. Now then, if I start training my battle cruiser skill to five and the patch hits, it will copy the skill points over directly. So, you know, I'm not losing anything. Am I gaining? No. Well, I'm still gaining. Am I gaining as much as I could potentially be? No, not really. But I'm also not being, not taking time out of getting better at doing the things I enjoy just for something that I might choose to fly six months down the road. Exactly, Kristoff. Um, you know, if you don't have a Tech 2 tank, it doesn't matter if you have the battle cruiser skill. You don't need to be flying a battle cruiser without a Tech 2 tank. It makes a huge difference on them. Um, I mean, if you're really, if you are really concerned about, yeah, exactly, Francesca, uh, if you're really concerned about it, then right about the beginning of May, if you have a remap available, a remap into um, Perception Primary, Willpower Secondary, and just go ahead and slap destroyers and slap battle cruisers and any of the relevant frigate and cruiser skills you need into your queue. But until then, train your support skills. You will get more usage and more enjoyment out of the game by doing that than by training up for something that you may or may not have the skills to fly and may or may not even want to fly. Free skill points don't matter much if you never use them. All right, rant over. Sorry, just I see that a lot, and I know we've got a lot of new players. Yes, actually, um, I could someone link could someone link Saluna's post? There you go. Saluna's got a very good overview on when it's good to start doing that stuff in time for the past. If I may, I have chosen to 
as I call it, climb on the wagon. So I, I want to have better cruise of five before the change, and I'm glad I have a month longer than I thought. And I, I I'm completely aware that that puts me on record of losing ships, so I plan not to not to, to not to use them. And I completely agree with Fenris. Um, Ed is hurting me, not not in the sense that he says that I can lose ships because I won't, because I will be careful, but it puts off doing stuff that I want to do by months. <laughs> I'm happy, I'm, I'm still going to finish with it, this plan. It's a great way to have some flexibility later on because it's a time investment. But right now, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck at doing level twos and maybe even a level three once in a while. Yeah. Um... You know, and honestly, if for the younger, or well, not for the younger, um, for the newer characters, what Saluna recommends there is definitely a very, very good plan. If you really want to get the most out of it and you're only a couple months old or less, or even a little bit more, all racial frigates to four, Destroyers to five, racial cruisers to three, battle cruisers to three, um, will go ahead and mean that after the patch, you can fly every single racial ship that is battle cruiser class or smaller, and you are ready to train into every single race's battleship at that point. Um, it, it, it's a good goal if. If you can afford to spare the 26 days, well, less. Um, Alyssa recommended skill, like recommended support skills and levels. Oh, that's pretty easy. If it's a support skill, you generally speaking want to have it at four or five. Um, there, uh, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of time before you're going to get them all at five. Um, the sooner you can get all the support skills to four or five, the better off your life is going to be. That being said, training nothing but support skills and staying in a frigate your whole life is really, really boring. Most people go ahead and get up into cruisers and sit and fly cruisers, learn the game, and branch out from there. Um and generally speaking, I mean, I would really love it if I could magically snap my fingers and have all my support skills at five. I, I mean, I would, like, literally be so happy I don't think I could actually sit and play the game for a couple of days. I'd just be too bouncy. Um, yeah, Lynn, you laugh, but I'm serious. Um, uh Every single every single day I log on, I, I look at the train time of the support skills, and it's like, oh, man. Because most of my support skills are at four or better. Um, I, I, I didn't mean to look, I'm not sure how you say, say this in English. I not meant to direct, to, 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 wrong in any way. It was positively. Oh, no, no, no. I, I know. It's just... It's one of those things of the the support skills are amazingly useful, and once you get them up to four, your life gets easier. Um, you know, I would definitely recommend training the ones that affect the stuff you do first. Um, yeah, cap support skills are really long trains. Uh, getting them up to four is just great. Putting them up to five takes a little bit of time. Um, so, you know, that's the reason why four or five. A lot of it's going to depend on the train time. For for the skills that are, you know, a times two or less, you know what, go ahead and train them up to five as soon as you can. It eats a week out of your training, and it's not going to kill you. And as soon as you can does not mean, like, go and figure out how you can jam them all in for the next, you know, three months straight. Just, oh, hey, look, you know, I finally got my cruisers to four, and I've got all my guns at four, and so drop a couple, drop a support skill in. It's not going to kill you. It'll make your life easier and better. 
Um, for the ones that have the much longer train times, um, advanced weapon upgrades five, I'm looking at you. Yeah. You know what? When you're going to be taking that nice long summer vacation and you're not going to be able to be on the computer for 25, 30 days, pop advanced weapon upgrades into the skill queue. It's going to take a thir- it's going to, it's about a 30 day train. Um, you will walk away. You will leave, you will enjoy your vacation, and you will come back, and you will find out that your pilot has magically gotten better at fitting guns on his ship, and you have not had to suffer through it. Uh, yes, cybernetics is one of those skills that training up to four is not a bad thing. Um, being able to inje- put plus four implants in is fantastic. It does help with the train time. However, the flip side of that is is especially for newer players, implants cost money. Um, a full set of plus four of plus fours averages about 125 million disc. Um, the really bad thing is that they don't really they do increase your train time over plus threes, but only over the long haul. Um, you know the difference the difference between getting the difference between actually getting the plus threes and the plus fours you're not going to notice the difference until you've been playing the game for a couple of years there's the link to saluna's post on training for the patch yes it is so any other questions? Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. When you were talking about uh, fitting Tech 2 guns earlier and mentioned that power grid and CPU requirements are virtually the same, um, you were using Mimitar as an example, so it didn't have any cap requirements. Do the Tech 2 guns use the same amount of cap as uh, Tech 1 guns if you're flying hybrids or uh, lasers? Well, um, I want to say that, yes, they use the exact same amount of cap, or no, they use the exact same amount of cap as their Tech 1 versions. That being said, let's go check, because I don't actually use, um, (laughs) I don't actually use Tech 2 lasers and stuff yet. Working towards it, as soon as I get Minmatar Cruisers 5 done. Uh, let's see. The dual per the dual pulse eats up 2.67 gigajoules, and the dual pulse two eats up 2.67 gigajoules. So yes, they're using the same amount of cap. The biggest problem with fitting Tech Two is not really the Tech Two modules; it is fitting the Tech Two ships. Um, I just had the market open. I closed it by accident. Um, i give you one of my favorite examples because it's the one I beat my head against uh, repeatedly. Okay, we got two ships here. One is the Breacher. The other is the Hound. A Breacher is a Tech 1 Memnitar missile frigate. Um, if you go and you look at its fitting... You know, it's got 180 CPU, 35 power grid, 400 calibration, three lows, four mediums, three highs. Now, if you go look at a Hound, it's got a lot more CPU, 303 to be precise. It's even got more power grid. Three lows, three mediums, five highs. Seems like everything would be great, right? Only problem is the Hound is a stealth bomber. It is intended to fit torpedo launchers. Even with a 99.65 reduction in torpedo launcher power grid needs, yeah, putting three torpedo launchers pretty much puts you in the negative on power grid and compared to putting three launchers on the the breacher. Um, No. I didn't lose connection. Got a little bit of Wi-Fi growth. Sorry. Okay. 
Yeah, no, I know. I am not getting apple pie tonight. Uh, that definitely got made pretty clear when your cooking, not me, I work today, came out of her mouth. <laughs> oh, life anchor. Um, but, yeah. As, as I was saying, uh, no, ac- actually, Spanky, I will probably go ahead and cook actual real food. I don't, I, I can grill, but I can all cook too. Uh, yes, the class is officially over. That's why I'm, yes, and there is another class in the channel in 15 minutes. So if you guys want to book, y'all can book. Um, I was just going to say thanks very much. I, I got in late, so I didn't have the uh, chat channel open to follow that, but I appreciated uh, being able to listen to that. So thanks very much for doing that class. Hey, not a problem, this. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, but the person that had asked the question about the Tech 2s, did that kind of answer the question about the deal with fitting on the Tech 2s? Uh, yeah, it did. Thank you. All right. Um yeah, because uh, a lot of times it's not so much that the Tech 2 modules are the issue. It's just how much you have to actually cram into a Tech 2 ship. There's just, you got to start making sacrifices at some point. The fitting skills just make you make less. Yeah, you could actually cut the recording now because I actually need to go smoke a cigarette and start looking around for stuff. <laughs>